Hello, friends, and my name is Steve. Welcome to the Friday Conversation, episode 86. Thanks you, thank you all for listening, and hope you all had a great week. We are here with some friends today. Uh, Michael, will you start us off with an introduction, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Michael Armella. I'm the author of the Dragon's Blade trilogy and the ongoing dry, uh, Dragon Rider epic, Songs of Chaos. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. We know you're busy. And Muriel. Uh, so my name is Muriel, and uh, I'm a literature enthusiast and a very small booktuber, and my booktube channel is The Purple Bookworm, with a Y in the worm. <laughs> yes. be, sure, be sure and link that down below for everyone to check out. And uh, so, Michael, for those those people who aren't familiar with you or your work, can you tell us about it? Sure, I'll, I'll speak a bit about the current series, Songs of Chaos, because that's what people sort of most know me for at the moment. Um, as I say, it's a big, it's a Dragon Rider epic, kind of in the spirit of Aragorn, Pern, that sort of thing. Obviously, people, there's been a bit of a rash lately of Dragon Rider um, books, which is great. So if you're if you've heard of uh, Dragon Mage by M. L. Spencer, The Bound of the Broken by Ryan Cahill. You know, we're playing in a similar ballpark, but mine's a little bit different being um, uh, a little bit based on, with a progression fantasy uh, magic system, uh, inspired partly by Cradle, uh, Will White's Cradle. Um, and the dragon, in the, the main dragon in the story is blind, and so his bond with the, the young character is much stronger because of that. And the magic system is so heavily based on how the bond works but that was partly sort of helped propel them through the various ranks of power in that story. Um, many other things besides, but I guess that's a very quick, <laughs> quick look in. <laughs> and I uh, just want to welcome our friend Paramita. She was able to make it. It's always good to see. Uh, Paramita, will you to give us a quick introduction? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm Paramita. I'm a member of the Page Chewing Forum, and I love to read fantasy and science fiction. Glad you could make it. We were just saying a lot of awful things about you before we started recording. No, <laughs> no we weren't. <laughs> the, the trail is noted. <laughs> yeah. no, glad you could make it. It's always great to have you. Uh, uh, Michael, I, I read on your bio that you started your first book at 10 years old, and you, you kept going through different drafts, and you are finally able to publish it in November of 2015. And I wondered, how many drafts did you go through but how many times did it change? And it must have been <coughs> numerous. Oh, geez. Where, which bio was that? <laughs> on your website? I like I'd up, <laughs> on the website? Oh, God. Yeah. I, need to update. I thought that one had been taken away, that version. Um, hmm. How embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, in air quotes, started with when I was 10. That's when I felt like I had the idea for the first series, which is not Songs of Chaos. That's my first series, The, the Dragon's Blade. Um, but I, I, so I picked away, as you might do when you're 11 or 12, at like something here or there, but it was obviously absolutely terrible. Um, but I very much put it on ice for a long time. So I wasn't really working on it for most, most of that time. I, I really started working on it in earnest. Um, in early 2015, actually, when I was down in London doing a law course and had a quarter life crisis and realized that is not what I want to do. <laughs> And uh, writing became an escape for various reasons. And I, I threw myself into really, I had some amount of material, but, you know, very rough stuff. And I, I sort of finished the, the first book off in that year uh, and then released it at the end of that year in November. Um, so not quite as many drafts as you might think over, the, <laughs> over all those years in between. Um, but I do revise quite heavily as I go, but not in like full drafts. So it's kind of hard for me to quantify how many drafts as such that I make because often I'll redo a chapter several times or edit it very heavily before I even get to the end of the book. Um, so. Nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just, I wondered what, what that experience was like to have something that you kind of started brewing at, you know, 10 years old and then having to go through all these different, you know, through your life and all the changes that you go through in life and then seeing, looking back on it and, and getting out to publish, it must have yeah. been a great, a great feeling to know that that story evolved, but it was still something that you shared with everyone. Yeah, the ideas evolved. You know, like if mm -hmm. if it wasn't literal drafts that changed, it was the ideas vastly, vastly changed. I mean, they were crazy. Some were really, some of the ideas were really bonkers, really weird, um, as you will over all that time. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, what ended up being in the book was a relatively good, coherent team solid epic fantasy idea without crazy ideas of like 
multiple planets and weird machines from you know watching Star Wars and stuff like this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> luckily, I managed to parse it down in the end. Um, but yeah, getting it out there, it was very cathartic. As I say, like I had to, it, it just became an escape valve. Like I, I felt like really I had to write those books in order mm-hmm. to kind of, I don't know, just shift and do something that I really wanted to do. It was um, it was both therapeutic and chasing the dream all at once. So, and it was a bit all consuming to be honest. I look back in that time, and I'm amazed that I managed to keep going, doing you know everything else I had to do. You know, and then initially you work. And writing isn't full time yet, and I just I don't know how I kept going because I get tired now, and I, I feel like back then I managed to make it through all that, and it somehow still had energy. I wouldn't be able to do that now. I think it would break me. So, yeah, I'm very fortunate that it worked out. Uh, I well, I ha- I have a sensible question and a fiery question. Which should I go for first? You pick. the nonsensible question. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, Mr. Miller, I was looking at your bio on the website and uh, your series is Aragon meets Burn meets Cradle, which is a very, very intriguing combination. Uh, I have read Arag- Aragon and uh, I believe Muriel has read Burn and Aragon. I have read the, I've read the Inheritance Cycle and I've read eight Pine books. Out of thirty, is it what a, a, a reasonable chunk of the pun books? Yes. Uh, I was wondering uh, how you coalesced all these very very different uh, elements into your series, or how the inspirations for your series came. Well, in some ways, Perrin is not quite the best describer, but. It, it's a bit it's very much it, Aragon is a big inspiration clearly Cradle definitely is but there's more of how to train your dragon in there than oh. Pern but I used Pern as the kind of because it is written as a kind of epic fantasy that's not for it is it's written for adults but anyone can read it it's kind of ageless because there's not a lot of there's no swearing there's no um um, adult material, let's say. There's there's very little, there's none of that. There is a so, bit of adult material in the pun books, though. But I agree that you exactly. can't. Exactly. Which, is why, which yeah. is why I, which is, yeah. but there is. Oh, yeah. But mine sorry. don't. Yeah. As long as it, mine don't have that. Um, yeah. It, so, uh, I mean, the main, the main relationship between Holt, the, the young uh, kitchen boy, and Ash, our blind dragon, is much more reminiscent of Toothless and Hiccup than any other um, pairing. So I probably, but I was, because I have this slight problem that some people think the book's for kids, and it's not, it really isn't for kids. Young people can read it, and they can enjoy it. Also adults, I've got people in my Discord who are in their 60s, you know, that are, are loving it. I've got folk that are teenagers in there loving it. It's it's written deliberately to be a bit ageless and not to put any one age bracket off, which has helped me because I know quite a lot of families listen to the audiobook on long car drives in the, in the States. Um, so... Perrin is probably not the best descriptor in that sense, but it helps just key you in, I think, that people realise it's in that epic fantasy bracket. It isn't um, aimed too young. Um, but yeah, it's a bit more how to train your dragon than Perrin. But really, it just you just blend it all up. I mean, I, I mean, why is Ash blind? Ash is blind partly because I really loved um, how Hiccup and Toothless um, rely on each other so much because um, Toothless can't fly without Hiccup. And that felt like a really unique aspect of like, because what, what always felt strange to me in every Dragon Rider story that I ever came across, and Aragorn still being the big one, is I don't really understand what the dragon got out of the, the bond. It seems that the dragon had all the magic, all the power, all the majesty, and then just for some reason allows a human to siphon and bond with them and get a lot of perks. And I just was like, but what are they getting out of it? It doesn't, you know, it's fine, there's a... But I just, it doesn't seem realistic. Why would they do that? Why, why would they Why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but it did in How to Train Your Dragon because for who, um, for Toothless and Hiccup, Toothless really needed Hiccup, vice versa. And then those dragons, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking more of the movies, but, you know, the dragons and the humans become friends and that's a big change from hurting each other and hunting each other. Um, so that all worked very well. I was just thinking with my series, okay, so I want there to be a really critical reason why dragons and humans bond um 
that there's a benefit in this series to the bonding system. The dragons benefit magically from humans bonding to them because the humans can tend to their core. So the dragons have the magical core and the humans via the bond can cleanse it, forge it, make it stronger. So a dragon in the wild will still have a core and will be magical, but a dragon in the order with a rider will gain a lot of power a lot faster and will effectively be stronger. So like a, a rider or a rider's dragon will be much, much stronger than their wild kindred. And in this world, this existential generational threats from the scourge, this big zombie bug, horrible thing that rises every so often. So the dragons want to fight that. Um, so when the bond is very much, when there's a reason that the rider uh, has a purpose in the bond, the bond becomes very important. And then I was like, okay, let's supercharge that with a hiccup toothless situation. So, okay, that was, I think, and in, in, in those movies, Toothless loses a bit of his, um, like, um, tail wing or something, like, a bit of the tail wing gets um, torn away, right? So Hiccup does this engineering thing, which is really cool, because he's an inventor, um, which obviously pairs up very, very nicely. Um, so I was just searching around for something like that to, to latch on to. Uh, and at the time, I was watching Daredevil season three, which I absolutely mm. loved. I thought Daredevil was really cool. I just, and I thought, well, why the dragon could be blind. That might, that would work pretty well. That would have some cool, unique aspects to it. And so that was, that was kind of the, where that started was I, I wanted Holt and Ash to have a very strong bond, give a real reason for that. The magic system works this way, uh, that the bond is very important. Um, and, and then being blind and him being blind is unique because the dragons in this world would never let a egg hatch that they deem to be defective and making air quotes again they wouldn't let anything any weakness as they perceive it to hatch but hope's compassion compels him to save this egg once he finds this out as she's hatched and voila they bond uh, so that's a long that was a bit of a rambly explanation but um yeah it's kind of like just taking the bits that I, you start with i really want the bond to make sense and then Okay, if the bond is very important, I want it to be a very strong bond. How am I, how am I going to set that up in the world building and with their relationship? And off, off we go from there. Can, can I ask them? Yeah. It, would would the, the relationship between Ruth and Jackson in the pan books also be a source of inspiration since that no. dragon is also... No? Because that's also a dragon that the egg is kind well, of the runt of the litter and almost left for dead. Makes, I mean, obviously it's a tropey idea, but I haven't really read that much of Pern. So I can't, if, um, you know, there's a white dragon in Pern as well, I believe, right? There's white dragons everywhere. Ash is yeah. of white, I would be no, yeah, it's just, um, probably tapping into the same tropes, like underdogs and, and whatnot, but I haven't read that relationship. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't have been a direct influence. No, but it, it may well be similar for all I know. Yeah. And my other question was, so yeah. is the, since you, you mentioned Daredevil, so is the idea with yeah. the blindness that the sense, so the lack of a, of a, of a sensory perception then enhances the bond? Like hearing can be enhanced in, in, in some blind yeah. people, I believe. Is it that general idea? Uh, well, a little bit that comes into play, but it's more like when, when Ash hatches as a complete baby, you know, he's blind, so he's confused and wandering yeah. around in the dark as such. And the he, and Holt is right there as he hatches. So Holt was the first, you know, living being he comes across. So the dragons in this world bond, usually it's more, usually it's very deliberate. Like the dragons pick a human that they think is going to be good for them. And it's a bit picky and they take their time. And sometimes they never bond at all. And so, but because Ash was obviously hatched, confused and scared and everything else, and Holt's right there and Holt's, being nice and offering them food, they just bond immediately. Yeah. Um, so, and because Ash really, really needs Holt early on, the bond is just so much stronger. And in the world building, normally dragons never bond that young. Normally they're already kind of fully grown and then they bond. So, yeah. So it's like a double whammy of, he kind of needs a little bit of extra help, but he's also like a baby when he bonds. So it's even, even stronger. But yes, over the series, the... The I you know uh, it's, it's minus spoilers but not massive minus spoilers over the series you know hope they they learn to adapt to that very well and Holt is able to start using Ash's increased hearing like Daredevil to also be able to put a blindfold on fight in the dark that sort of thing which is very useful when you have to fight horrible nasty bugs in dark tunnels underground and 
at night um, because Ash is a lunar dragon. He's, his magic is associated with the moon and the stars. Um, and when they create big light bombs, it can sort of daze and disorientate enemies. But if they have their, you know, if Hulk has his blindfold down and Ash is blind anyway, they can kind of have some advantages that way. So that, that daredevil aspect comes into play there. But initially it's all just about Hulk, uh, um, Ash just really needing hope. Um, and it's just, it's a very wholesome sort of experience. So a lot of the other ways that people bond in the world, it can be, you know, the dragons can be, they can come from good, good intentions. They want to fight this existential threat. They want power to fight the existential threat, but they're sort of driven by the power or they're driven by something else. It's not just as wholesome as just, I need you, I want you, you're my yeah. friend, you're my best friend, you know? Yeah. So it, they're, they're set up to be quite unique, deliberately so, based on the world building. Um, yeah, that's, that's why. Um, I was wondering if I could uh, ask a question to maybe all the panelists, starting with Mr. Miller, of course. Um, I was uh, reading a bit, Mr. Miller, on your website about uh, lit RPG and uh, how it is a growing subgenre in fantasy. I also see a lot of posts on Reddit fantasy. And uh, in fact, uh, I was listening to a Twitch stream by one of my favorite authors, and he also mentioned this uh, lit RPG series called uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl. So it is a, it is the sort of uh, new uh, subgenre of fantasy which I myself am a bit unfamiliar about. But uh, I know my other two panelists at least they uh, they do play games, they do watch. Uh, uh, many other uh, forms of media in addition to also reading books. And I wondered if uh, you had any thoughts on how these uh, different forms of media, so for example, a video game and a novel, which we traditionally assume is almost fully text, uh, how these meet in this subgenre called uh, lit RPG? Uh, is it sort of this uh, having the best of both both worlds, whereby you can explore the world a bit as you would in a video game while also having the sort of core plot line of a novel. Yeah, I mean, lit RPG is a very, very broad uh, category and it's, um, it's, it's changing very, very fast, even as, you know, it's, it's a bit like the Wild West still, it's changing very, very fast. You're right in that. It, it began kind of like, uh, as if you guys are familiar with Ready Player One. Yes. So Lit RPG begins a little bit like how Ready Player One is, where there's a big VR world. We will do a story in that VR world, almost entirely in that world. Sometimes there's references to the, to the real world. Sometimes the characters come in and out. Sometimes they just stay in the game world. But when they're in the game world, there's a lot more actual statistics, like as if you were playing a real game, there's character screens, numbers, people level up. The character has to choose how to allocate their talent points and what gear they put on and all the rest of it. As, as, if, you're watching, as if you're watching a Twitch stream in book form, kind of, but there's usually a story associated, you know, there's usually a, some kind of story going along with that, like the school. Like, and one of the famous ones is like... Uh, you know, the school bully in real life gets defeated in the game, that sort of thing. Um, but these days, like, RPG has sort of shifted away from the VR thing completely and it's moved into kind of like um, other dimensional worlds where you the character might wake up one day, they've just reincarnated in a different dimension that happens to run off of game mechanics. So there's no VR. The real world doesn't exist. It's gone or, you know, they've fallen into a portal and they pop out in a in a place where the world happens to be run by game mechanics or there's like some um, element that makes that happen. Um, the, the, the main thing for like RPG is that there's hard game mechanics in there, there's numbers in there, um, uh, and, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it's a story like anything else. It's the best way, in fact, the easiest way to think about it is just they're fantasy stories usually, or sci-fi stories with ludicrously hard magic systems. Where, where you actually see the numbers and stuff like that. Some people take it very seriously and will actually start rolling dice and things like that as they, as they write. But you know, you got to sometimes bend the rules. You got to, your character has to come up lucky a few times, right, to me, <laughs> for things to work out. Um, so yeah, I I wrote one book in this space called Battle Spire, which works as a standalone. It's essentially, you know, Ready Player One, or if you like World of Warcraft meets Die Hard, and it's very much exactly what it sounds like. Hmm. 
But Songs of Chaos is not that. <laughs> Songs of Chaos <laughs> is an epic fantasy with a hard-ish magic system, but some soft elements as well. Hmm. What about you, Miria? What, you, what are your thoughts on Lit RPG? Well, I wasn't really acquainted with the specifics of it. I, I'd, it's interesting, though, because actually recently a friend of mine mentioned a book he'd read uh, a few years ago called Epic, written by uh, an Irish author named Connor Costing. And that apparently is considered a very early example of lit RPG, but then I was like, I'm not entirely sure what that means. So it's interesting to to get a, a bit of a definition on that sub-genre. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes it's hard to explain. The best way right. is just to pick, pick one up and read yeah. a bit, and then you'll be like, oh, I get it. You'll immediately understand. Oh, okay. It's just sometimes it's hard to explain. People think it's choose your own adventure. It's not that. They no. Think it's, some, they think it's based off of actual games. It's not. They're totally made up games. Like, it's just, just pick up. The best way to is just pick one up at random right. levels and have a read, and you'll be like, oh, I, I understand now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I've I've played RPGs. Yeah. And I'm, it's it's hard for for me to imagine <laughs> if I were to take I don't know, Dark Souls, as a novel. I'm try. <laughs> my my brain is glitching on that. So um, I, I'd have I'd have yeah I'd have to pick one up and just kind of look at what it is. So I don't I don't really have a specific opinion because I'm just a bit ignorant about that subgenre. Yeah, lit RPGs are. They're kind of a new thing to me too. I've only read one. I read Light Blade by Zamil Akhtar, and I, I got through the book, and everybody kept. Well, what did you think of letter the, that genre? And I, I didn't notice it was that genre, but kind of the way that, um, kind of the way that I, that I think of them as the, the character grows, almost like, progresses with the story, and they, the character Ooh. blossoms, and it's not so much of of uh, discovering things about the character, but the the character grows and like levels up through the through the uh, course of the story. It's kind of the way that I took it. But I I think, um, I, I think lit RPG, you think lit RPG, you think more interactive. I think the the title of lit RPG, I think it, it gives the impression that it is like, almost like a choose your own adventure or that's not what it is. So it's, I think some people are a little bit confused by it. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I think having the, the, character grow with with you as you as you go through the story and not already be established as something that is is fun for me but i'm not really if i read a lit rpg book i don't know that i'd know that i read one is the thing oh you'd know if you read a oh. really heavy one. Oh, okay i we're talking the character panel comes up with the the numbers your level oh. your mana points all that stuff that's full oh. on lit rpg i think what you i think it's a meals book is progression fantasy which is adjacent but it's not oh, okay. full blown by RPG like, yeah I was going to say that you, sounds yeah. like power progression fantasy right yes. power leveling fantasy okay. yeah. they're, they're obviously all related I mean really yeah. like RPG has morphed basically into progression fantasy because that's what people are getting out of it and people are okay to not have the numbers the numbers started there because it really was about experiencing really cool game world but we've everything sort of smoothed away from that and it's gone into secondary world stuff. Sometimes it's very, very hard. Sometimes there's still some screens, but it's a bit soft. But progression mm -hmm. fantasy is really where it's kind of ended up, where you get very, very hard, very defined magic power systems usually. And the kind of the point is the character begins at zero and is you, you get that promise that they're going to become god tier by the end of the series. Yeah. 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 Have you guys read Cradle? By Will White, by any chance, or any, anything of that series? No. I just I know have, of it. Yeah, same. I have uh, heard a lot of reviews about it, but every time I hear yeah. 12 books, and then I get scared. Yeah. So, yeah, Cradle's <laughs> the quintessential uh, progression fantasy. Oh, okay. They're shorter books, thankfully. They're not huge tomes. You know, they're like 100,000 tops each one. But, yeah, you know, they, they, our main character starts absolutely less than nothing and you're promised he's going to become a god and effectively that's what happens over the course of the series the, 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 it's, it's, it's fun it's action heavy it's um, pacey great zany characters very kind of anime inspired kind of a lot of it's eastern storytelling inspired um, that kind of adjacent um, Quaidle's great it's really addictive really really addictive and it was a big inspiration on Songs of Chaos for sure 
Um, yeah, I was just going to say, some of those characteristics make me think of, like, yeah, sh shonens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, exactly. I guess it leads me to the, my next thought is, one or, one or, one or too many subgenres too many? And when it becomes <laughs> so confusing that we we have to kind of I mean when when does it become too much? When do we have too many subgenres? And as well, I, as I you market, this... does that make it harder to market too? I think it can make it harder to market only because everyone no one can agree what any of the terms mean, and so <laughs> everyone just makes it up. And so you know, <laughs> Songs of Chaos is a children's fantasy, or it's a YA fantasy, or it's a this or it's a that, and it can be none of those things because everyone thinks it's slightly different or they, their interpretation of it is different from... So it can be hard because everyone seems to think that epic fantasy means something different from everyone else and progression fantasy means something different from someone else. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's difficult. But then, as um, I'm sure both as, as authors, it can be cool to find a, a really interesting niche that you like and people love to write in niches. And audience, you know, readers really like to find a new niche sometimes, you know, like they stumble across a style of story they've never come across before. They, they love that. They ask, hey, can I see examples, like other things like that? And mm. so eventually there's a tag around it and people can point towards another list of 100 books with that, you know. So, yeah, pros and cons. The Amazon, Amazon can't keep up. Amazon can never keep up. <laughs> there's no lit RPG category. Well, I think that might be soon, but it's taken them about eight years. Um... You know, there's no there's no specific dragon rider fantasy category, which is bizarre because there's so much of that, and there's so all the that's all a jumbo. It is a bit of a mess. Um, in fact, you're you're better to have more, but we need to all agree on what they mean, and that's not going to happen. So yeah, maybe it's maybe it would be impossible. I think I, I generally agree with that. I think there are pros and cons. On the one hand, I'm I have an affinity for like categorizing things yeah. i do like category thinking that's just kind of how i function but at the same time it's true that you kind of need to have at least somewhat of a consensus on what this subgenre means and what this subgenre means and recently i discovered i thought i knew there was cyberpunk steampunk and what's the other one biopunk now i discovered there's also silk punk and solar punk so many other punks <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh I, I don't know what those, those things are gas lamp Gas lamp. Gas lamp. Yeah. Oh yeah. Gas lamp. Wait, wait, what's that? Uh, um, I'm, well, my my understanding that gas lamp is kind of like, or like, kind of like Victorian. Well, Victorian esque is steampunk, but it's kind of like around that time, but not mechanical. Ah. Okay. But someone's going to slaughter me in that interpretation as well. <laughs> probably, I'll probably get that wrong. <laughs> sort of like early modern esque, but no. No mechanical tech, no industrial tech, but uh, so gas lamp, not electric lamp, but you know, right. could be wrong. Okay, yeah. Could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, recently, I came across. Uh, it was a uh, so I have a, a small Discord server for for my YouTube channel, and and one of the people there presented a, a word for like um, what I would have called his uh, alternative historical fiction so it's it's historical fiction but speculative as well because it's like yeah what if this had happened in history and the term was uchronia what i've never I heard think? of that no but it was, it was interesting <laughs> i was like i've never seen that before okay why not i guess <laughs> that's new to me there you go i learned something new yeah every day <laughs> what was the term uchronia uchronia i think yeah I'll have Ooh. to look it up afterwards. Yeah. But yeah, and Silk Punk. The other day it was just in a video and I was like, Silk Punk. And what is like, Silk Punk? I, I believe it's... That there's a certain focus on, on Far Eastern aesthetics. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, the Dandelion I Dynasty, I think, is uh, yeah. Silk Punk ah, by okay. Ken Liu. So the, uh, the in inventions that you, he uses in his series. Steve mm -hmm. has read the series. I think you enjoyed it a lot as well. I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, the second book is one of my favorites, and uh, Ken Liu is brilliant. But yeah, he he does. I think he gave us a, he kind of gave us his insights of what silk punk is, and I'm not sure I still understand it. But <laughs> there's a uh, there's lo uh, lots of, but just a uh, just a fun uh, fun fact. I looked up on Goodreads what Gas Latin Fantasy is, and the fir the first book listed is Jonathan Strange and Mister Norrell. 
Okay. Really? Sure. Yeah. This sure. is my favorite book, so oh. yeah. I guess I love. Hey, I love Gaslight. Like, uh, I didn't. I to say my favorite could be tough, but it's easily top five. I absolutely. Yeah, yeah, top five. That's what I mean. Top yeah. three. Yeah, Probably yeah. top three. Yeah, top. Oh. Yeah, po- quite possibly top three. Well, yeah, I love you. I, I'm going to read it this year. So. Okay. <laughs> do you like audio books, or do you mostly read, Miru? Uh so I mostly read text, but I've I've gotten back into audio books a little bit, so I'm open to going audio book route. I, I mostly do audio, so that's you know take that for a pinch of salt. But the audio book for Jonathan Strange is really excellent. Mm. Um, okay. Because she does the pastiche so well, um, I think it okay. suits. Well, I, I felt it really suited someone reading it because for me, more of the humor came out, the cadence, you know, because he can act through the. Because so, a lot of the humor is in how people are being polite, but yet awful to each other, and that kind of you know, AT, you know, you know, Jane Austen style sort of writing. Um, and it came through really well on, on the on the narration. So, oh, um, I, yeah, I would, I would definitely recommend consider- giving it a go. Okay, cool. Yeah, I would definitely re- uh, consider doing that because, like, I listened to. Uh, so I, I read uh, the Name of the Wind and uh, the Wise Man's Fear for the first time this year, thanks to my friend Paramita, and I. Very happily surprised with how much I liked it, but I, and I listened to it on audio, and it was a very enjoyable experience. So I'm definitely open to doing more books in audio book format. Uh, this this is going to segue very nicely into my next question for everyone, but especially Mr. Miller. Epic fantasy. What are some of your favorites, or just in general, what are some of your favorite fantasy works that you recommend? I ask everyone this question. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah all the all the usuals um huge token fanboy love and then i love song of ice and fire just as much it's very you know you love them for different reasons uh jonathan strange and mr Norris, as we just said it's one of my favorite books so alas we've already talked about that um uh more recently oddly this year i i i dived into first law by Joe Abercrombie for the first time. I tried it years ago and bounced off of it for whatever reason, and I gave it another shot and I really enjoyed uh, the first trilogy. Um, really got into just the voice, just the voice, just the voice that he steeps into every character is just so wonderful, isn't it? Like just you could just and Stephen Pace narrating it, you could just listen to that all day. Absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, other things that I've enjoyed in recent years, uh, yeah, Cradle. We've talked about Cradle. Um, it's tough. I, I really I, I kind of pick up book ones a lot uh, since I've started writing. I kind of pick up you kind of pick up book ones, and I can find it hard to get into stuff now. Maybe it's because I know how the sausage is made. Maybe a bit too close to it. Um, so I can like like a book one, but I, it's rare that I feel ultra compelled to keep going. And I'm hoping I get over that. You know, I hope I can go back to just enjoying things more as I as I used to. But I don't know. Maybe that's the curse. Um, I think it's starting to lift. I think it's starting to lift a little bit. As um, as more ideas, so, so sometimes in the thought I draw blanks. As more recommendations come to me, I will I will sprinkle them in. Um, would you guys have like a favorite read of this year so far? Fantasy, I would say *Lud in the Mist* by Hope Merlees. It's really. Quaint standalone. It was published in 1926, and uh, 1926. Well, wow. yes, and uh, Neil Gaiman is a big champion of this book, and uh, mm. he blurbed Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell as the best British fantasy written in 70 years. So that 70 right. years, because it was published in 2004, is a reference to *Lud in the Mist*, because uh, *Lud in the Mist* is sort <coughs> of the tiny, tiny inspiration. For mm-hmm. Jonathan, so it's part mystery. It's part. It's a very short book, but it's magical and it's uh, all the things that I want uh, fantasy to be. So th- that was a really lovely reading experience for me. Uh, so for me, um, not considering rereads, <laughs> I've, I've had more luck with my rereads. I think this year, except for so I I really loved what I read of the King Killer Chronicles. That's probably the best new fa- new for me fantasy I've read this year, and then more towards science fiction. Not the the kind of thing I usually read because I I know this is going to sound weird, but I tend to read less for sheer entertainment value. But this was just 
a giant bag of popcorn, but in the best way possible. It was the Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. I had mm. so much fun with that. Um, otherwise, I, th I think, yeah, those, those are the two new reads highlights for me this year. Unless I'm forgetting something very obvious at the minute. But th those are the ones that come to mind. Steve, you got a favorite? Yeah, I'm looking through my list on Goodreads, I think I've read a lot of I've had I've had quite the year, but I think uh I've had a pretty good reading year, everything else considered. Uh I think the one that stands out is um the Dandelion Dynasty, I think was probably the one I had the most fun with that I've finished this year. But I also really enjoyed Second Apocalypse. Um <clears throat> and there was some I don't know if you'd call that fun, but um yeah, but lots of great reads this year. But I think the one that I, or also uh, P.L. Stewart's books, I really enjoyed those. Um, so yeah, I think if I had to pick one, it would probably be the Dandelion Dynasty, I guess, would be the one I had the most fun with. I think uh, the second book especially was just spectacular. Amazing. I thought of a few more things just to toss in there. These are just things that have popped into my head, not like favorites or necessarily, though I do like them. Uh, but I, I returned to these ones a few times. Have you guys um, tried the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? It's very short. Hmm. It's um, C.S. Lewis writing letters from a, a senior devil to a junior devil, trying to teach him how to torment humans properly. Oh wow! What's, uh, what's, what's the name again? I'm oh, sorry. It's just so I can. <clears throat> it's called the Screw Tape Letters. Hmm. Screw Tape Letters. Yeah. And it is the most, it's like a work of genius. It's just so on the, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say the way that the, the, the devil teaches the younger devil, like how to really torment with humans. It's like all the subtle things, you know, he's like, don't, don't go for the big showy stuff. You want to, you want to just really make him hate the sound of his mother's voice. Just really, <laughs> really dig into that, really great it in. But, you know, <laughs> it's just stuff like that for it. But in the, but it's sort of set during World War Two, so like you know, they they refer to the human in question as the patient, and the patient is a, a, a just a guy in England during as World War Two starting, and how he how he may or may not be being tempted properly. It's very good. It's only like what forty five thousand words long or something. So an audio is about four and a half hours. That's another amazing audio book. Um, so that's one. That one's fantastic. Um, slightly more light hearted. Um, also oddly during set World War Two, um, called the Crow Folk by Mark Stay. Um, it's, it's the series is called the Witches of Woodville, um, and it's sort of like a, a coven of witches in this English village as World War Two is breaking out, getting up to hijinks. And there's um, there's some really touching moments in that first book, the Crow Folk, but it's also got a kind of Pratchetty, um, mm. uh, Douglas Adamsy vibe as well. So there's plenty of humour in it. Um, but also a lot of heart and it's, it's definitely different you know you want something a little different like which is during World War 2 England you get the, you get all the kind of yeah you get that whole era which is quite an interesting era to return to plus funny witches I know that was, that was just good that was a nice break from the usual big epic stuff you know um, other things as they jump to me I will I will again bring them up but those are two that I'd like to throw out there because I think uh, I think more people should try them Actually, speaking of audiobooks, I, I would recommend uh, the, the audiobook for Neverwhere. Uh, that was my, yeah. that's my first ever Neil Gaiman <clears throat> I read this year. Mm -hmm. It's not a new favorite, but it was, it was very enjoyable and, and it was a really good audiobook as well. There's another book, but that's one I'm, well, Parameter was recommended, but <laughs> I, I think it's, it's worth reading once in your life it, because it's very, very different to anything else. I've, I've ever read. Uh, I read the Gormenghast trilogy. It's very atmospheric and it's very strange, but it, it does have a certain charm to it. But it's it's very it's it's quite a commitment, uh, pages wise, and that just takes place in the sprawling castle somewhere in the world, and it's centered on this family and their very weird rituals with very goofy, strange characters. Uh, in they, our they, world or a different world? I think it's meant to be in our world. Okay. It, it's, but it's left ambiguous, yes. But it, it was um, 
It's an experience, and I, I'm glad I read it. I, 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 it's not a new favorite at all, uh, but it's definitely special. So, and it's Pat Paramita recommended it to me. So, <laughs> that that's the second of my top three. So it's Tokyo and Gorman Cast and. Uh, Okay, I, I would I would say a tie between Lord in the Mist and Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. <clears throat> but I mean, uh, yeah, th those, I'm those to are look my top. Lord in the Mist, my God, this is very highly recommended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you hate it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes this happens. <laughs> I recommend, and people are like, "What is this?" <laughs> That's always the fear, right? You say, this book is great, and then I hope they like it. <laughs> I, hope they like I, it. I tried to uh, sort of, uh, I don't know what the word is. In, uh, inspire it sounds very uh, haughty, so not inspire. But I sort of tried to enthuse uh, both uh, Muriel and Steve at different points into reading War and Peace. And sadly, my uh, efforts were thwarted. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I have to I have to read uh, *Crime and Punishment* first, okay? It's just what one big Russian author at a time. Uh, but uh, Mr. Miller, I was I was thinking of something. You spoke a little bit about how important the bond was to your uh, to the construction of your world and yeah. your fiction. Uh, I was thinking about whether you did you must have, but whether you had fun doing research on another aspect of the world building about the dragons themselves, whether you uh, like reading about the myths or just interesting facts about draconic creatures. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't delve into endless dragon lore because again, everyone has a different take on what those are. I mean, you get some really funny reviews on, on my books where some, some people say this this man doesn't understand how dragons work at all which is very funny because you know <laughs> as if there's a <laughs> as why if do you I, not understand as if I've really messed creature. up you know as if I've really messed up um, you know no I just I just went you know there's a few things there's a few decisions that I decided to make I decided to deliberately give them the four legs I know it's trendy now to the, that they don't have the, the two front legs and it's just the wings that they move forward you know with because that's more anatomically correct, um, but I don't care. Um, I wanted to, to evoke that how to train your dragon feeling. At least I wanted to make sure that Ash could could be as as awesome and lovable a friend to Holt as possible. So I just wanted to you just wanted to nudge him a little more towards like a big dog, like just a little bit than a big birdie thing with you know the the the, the two uh, wings. So I made that choice quite consciously. Like that's. And all the dragons have that, of course, and it's not so. Um, but they can be just as mean and grisly and awful with their with their four legs, because they have more claws to attack you with. Um, otherwise, I just I just ran with it. There's enough ambient dragon stuff out there. I just I just ran with what I wanted to for the series, um, because because the way that the their cores work, I mean, I d I don't need I don't really want to look into like some people say you've got to have them have hollow bones, so they fly. So the arrow then I'm like, no, they're magic, they fly. Okay? They're big, <laughs> they're magic, they fly. Um I like this fun slip it, but like that's I'm more I'm really keen on them being kind of mystical when I need them to be you know, some of them are mysterious, some aren't, but they're also just characters. The the dragons in this world talk, they're not um silent, so they will talk telepathically. So that's a kind of a um that's not every story has that, but because they talk, they're, they're full-blown characters, so some are good, and some are evil, and some are petty, and some are jealous, and some are... They're just, they're just characters, so... They, they, they're kind of anything, they're not... They don't act too animalistic in a certain... They don't act too much like an animal would in predictable ways, because they're just like people, they just happen to be scaly, winged, fire-breathing people. Well, actually, I, I, do, I do like this idea that, that you said you have that why if you if you start out from the premise that dragons in the world you created are sentient, very cognitively advanced beings, animals, what have you, yeah. then why would they just come along and be like, Yes, we will be ridden we will by humans. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Very demeaning, I, I, isn't it? <laughs> I like that you made it like it's a mutualistic or like symbiotic, yeah. whatever you want to call it relationship like the dragons yeah. are actually getting something out of this and they're humans too but i i, li I like that idea 
because yeah otherwise it's kind of like but you're treating these things that are supposedly super wise and intelligent like a like a horse <laughs> it's like well they don't like the dragons the dragons like you know that they don't like that and they're they're yeah. just as haughty and you know like they won't talk they typically only talk to humans that are other riders they won't talk to humans that are just yeah. regular humans they're very um, picky in that sense um so they have that kind of pride but yeah they that you're, you're bonding for essentially a um uh necessity in some ways like yeah. this this world ending threat that crops up once in a generation has to be fought and if, you know other times it pops up here and there all over the place um that has to be fought and the dragons that are willing to do that join the order to do that and it's a, it's it's um it, it begins with that sort of sense of um necessity but of course genuine friendships do form i mean even yeah. That the highest of the high ranks, you cannot get there. Is, uh, the, the way that the bond, the way that the magic and the bond develops, there's certain key milestones that I've marked in that are emotional based and you know um, insight, insight into one another and um, how much you trust each other and stuff like this. Like all that has to be there. So people, do, they do advance through those systems, but Hall and Ash go through it faster than anyone else because yeah. because of how they're set up. Yeah. Hmm. Other than your own dragons, do you have a favorite dragon or favorite type of dragon? Favorite type? Okay. What do you mean by type of dragon? Or favorite, I guess, um, favorite dragon that's been, or the version of dragon or just uh, uh, another that someone else had, had built in the mythology around them? Hmm. Hmm. That's tough, man. I mean, I I think the best <laughs> dragon that's ever been put on screen is is Smog. For as much as those movies had difficulties, like that was just incredible, uh, seeing him brought to life. Hmm. Uh, but like my kind of like yeah, like I think my favorite character of a dragon is probably Toothless, even though he doesn't speak. Like he's just really, he's just such a you just he doesn't need to speak. He's just he's he's fantastic. Even when he's really awkwardly trying to flirt with the the white dragon, it's just it's just brilliant. <laughs> Really failing and falling in his face, but he soldiers through like a trooper. <laughs> That's toothless. Um, yeah, the, I, no, I, I, I like many dragons, but those are those are probably the the favourites even though. I mean, I liked I liked Flemeth in Dragon Age a lot. I don't think she's meant to be specifically a dragon, but she becomes a dragon, mm. and I thought she's a character was very cool. And there's quite a bit of Dragon Age in the series as well. And it's, you know, the, the Order is a bit like the Grey Wardens a little bit. Mm-hmm. So there's definitely some, some inspiration from there as well. Uh, I was... Uh, I was thinking about what you said about this uh, telepathic communication, the possibility of telepathic communication between the uh, dragons and the riders, you know, world. And... Uh, as you said, that uh, it, they are not really, I, I mean, they are creatures, but they do have that uh, ability to understand. Uh, so I, was, I, I wanted to ask a bit, uh, how do they cope with feelings of loss? Or when their rider is in pain, or when their rider is in, uh, I'm not talking about maybe physical danger so much, but maybe hmm. when there is emotional anguish, is that something that the dragon senses? Yeah, they can feel it. Both both sides of the bond, they can feel each other's emotional anguish and turmoil. And to, to a certain extent, they can shield themselves a little bit from it and limit themselves a little bit so they don't get completely overwhelmed. But there are times if one is, if either one is extremely overwrought with some kind of emotion that will spill over. There are, there are, and typically in the series, they talk about because the magic of the bond flows dragon into human, you get that sense that the dragon flows into the human much more easily because that's the way that everything's flowing. So if the dragon is utterly, utterly enraged, the human can be gripped by that. Um, they have to work at that sometimes. It can happen vice versa. It's just a little It's just a little easier for the dragon to completely influence the human in that sense. Sometimes nefariously so as well, hmm. unfortunately. So it cuts both ways. But yeah, they, they really feel each other's emotions. Uh, but if the, you know, if the human... Or the dragon, I mean, it works both ways again. If one of them is very upset by something, if one of them is in grief or, or, or struggling, the other can send, like, literal emotional support overwards. Like, you can really, like, just lend actual, 
you know, you, they can make you feel better by or make you feel more confident, make you feel like you can cope because they're there to like take some of that weight off of you as well. So it, it can be both a negative and a positive in every sense. It's it's very it's very all consuming in some ways. It's very overwhelming. Hmm. Being bonded like that to a big dragon. Uh, I also wanted to, I forgot to mention this, but uh, the cover art of your books is really, really beautiful. I so, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask whether you had any uh, input on that or whether you can tell us a bit about how the cover <coughs> art was created. Yeah, the, the cover you see in Ascended now is actually not the original cover. Um, the original cover, uh, you can see it on my website under like an art section which I, I did like. I thought it was a great piece of art, but it didn't really work super well as a cover um, mm. just because it's a little dark. And actually, when you upload images onto Amazon, Amazon sort of desaturates and cuts some of it. So what happens is that usually dark, any cover you put up tends to look a little darker. So it was already a little dark and then it, it was a bit too dark. Um, so it didn't quite work. Um, I love the art, though, I, and I still have it there and hopefully I can use it someday in some form. Um, um, to, to honour it. The new cover art uh, was done by, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher his name, I think he's, I think he's from Turkey, Yigit Kon, Konolugu. Um, he does a lot of Magic the Gathering art now, I think. In fact, he oh. stopped being, I think this was the last freelance cover he ever did. And because I said, hey, can you do the second one? He was like, no, I'm going full time with, um, I think it was Magic the Gathering, but I, don't quote me on that. So uh, that was unfortunate because <laughs> it was so good. Um, <laughs> I, I was working with him, trying to get the pose right, and I had this. I had some ideas, and I asked a friend who's got a really good eye for art, and we had some ideas, but the sketches weren't quite working. We eventually just said, "We you you do on this. You know exactly what we're trying to do. Just you just do it in a way that feels better to you and more natural to you." And this, and then he came back with this pose, and so we, I was like, "Yes, go for it, hundred um, percent." So, I, if I had tried to, if I had tried to completely make it up, it would have been as good. It's good to have a good brief that's quite clear but then let the artist you know use their let the artist's instinct take over to figure out how to actually do what you do best and sometimes it it will never look exactly as you thought it would look but it will be better because they will they just have a better eye for like the composition and how things should sit on the page and with the title spacing and all the rest of it like you can get a rough idea in your head but don't get so precious because they'll know better than you the same way that you can hopefully write the book better than they could as well um so he, he did a fantastic job, um, but obviously your cover artist leaving is um, worrying. Uh, the chap that did books two and three, and will hopefully finish the series, is Randy Vargas. And Randy was really amazing because I could imagine that some artists would be um, not always willing to jump in like on a book two, where they have to sort of honour and imitate a little bit what, some other, what someone else has done in the original art, but he was absolutely happy to do that, no, no worries. And so you can tell that they are like a tiny bit different, but you would, you could, you could think the same artist did them all. Um, so he did a really good job honoring you gets work, but also putting his own spin on things for two and three. And um, that third one, I don't know how we're going to top that because I think it's just so cool. <laughs> mm. He's going to have his workout cut, cut out for him. How much of a, of, of a concern is it as, as you, have artwork that's being created for your work. How much is it a concern now of, of something being created with the AI for you? Um, you mean like someone making some AI art of songs of chaos mm -hmm. and then what, trying to sell it or something? Oh no. Like for, for, for the upcoming books, if you have an artist mm -hmm. that you've commissioned to create a cover, how, how closely do you look at the, at the artwork to look for things or is it not really something you're concerned about? Well, I, I, mean, I mean, for this series, using Randy, for I've got two more books to go, so that's mm -hmm. at least, and they're very big books, so I'm a couple of years still on this series, and so mm -hmm. there's two covers to go. I, Randy won't use AI, I trust him, so I, I'm not worried about that particularly right now. I think it's still, you can still kind of tell when someone's used AI stuff, because there'll just be stuff that's a little, AI cannot do hands. Have you noticed that? Like, it cannot do hands. Yeah, it can't do hands. No, Everything else can look quite good, but the hands are just bizarre. And in fact, yeah. a lot you can tell it's AI because a lot of it looks too good, too photorealistic, or like Unreal yeah. Engine 5 rendered. It's too... 
it's sort of too done up. There's not a lot of style. They, they all look tells. similar. There's yeah. some tails. There's, there's huge tails. So I think anyone... That, I mean, there was a... You know, there's been some controversy. I know in the indie community there was some controversy this year with a, a certain AI cover. Um, so it can slip by. Sometimes it's hard to tell, especially if they get really stylized. Um, but I'm not concerned. I mean, Randy won't do that. He's great. And I always deliberately look for artists with, you know, a good portfolio that are going to do it in their style and their way and you wouldn't be able to imi imitate that and yeah, but I, I'm not worried. I'm not worried because I'm in control of my book so I will put on it real art and that'll be fine. Hmm. Not so worried. I mean, honestly, I, some people, I know a lot of writers also are worried about it now, the AI stuff, but hmm. you know, this is my job. I'm not going to just suddenly stop my job because something is coming along that may or may not change things. I'm just going to keep going and and roll with what happens. But I'm always going to write. And if I can't write better than the robot, then <laughs> maybe <laughs> what's the point? But I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep doing it. You know, I can't suddenly just drop everything and <laughs> do something else. So I'm just going to stick at it and if, if, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't think... I hear a lot, I mean, I'm in circles where this stuff is discussed a lot as well because I have a lot of computer science friends and the AI debate, I think, is complex. I think there is, you should take it seriously, but do mongering about it, I think, is is counterproductive. And, and so even with people who are worried about AI, is what the solution to just roll over and die, so to speak? I, I don't think so. You don't yeah, well, you get, if, if, gonna, if writing or yeah. doing art is what you love, you're going to exactly. find a way to do it, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I think it sucks more now for artists because it's a little easier for people to spin up, you know, stuff for yeah. marketing or whatever. Yeah, I think that I think that's a little more scary for them. But then but then the people that really want to pay for actual art will hopefully still find them yes. in the right places that they still do and they'll, they'll find their audience. And they, if a big company wants to try and cheap out by using AI, whatever, well, I mean, that... that that is unfortunate, but I hope that the yeah. artists still keep making art because people are forever making art and finding ways to make it work and make a living. I think that yeah. will always be the case. I think, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff is inherently tainted by the financial considerations and all of that stuff, capitalism, yeah. etc. <laughs> but uh, creativity and, and the artistic impulse is just, it's a human thing, human why should we just stop doing that? Like I, I'm, I'm not a professional artist, but like I, I draw, I illustrate <coughs> in my spare time. I'm not just going to stop because robots <laughs> to put it <laughs> over simplistically, but yeah. So. Indeed. Like even AI narration that will, people will do it. People will pay for, people will just get an AI to narrate their audiobook. At least in the near future, it will not be as good. It will be obvious. It won't match a person. Um, and I would always get a person to do it because yeah. there's going to be stuff that the computer will just never get. It will never get certain interactions, I don't think. I, I don't know. Even as good as they're going to get, I don't know. I, I don't know because they're very good at um, following a logical sequence. Because mm -hmm. if you see the people that have asked it to write them a fantasy story, like it is very paint by numbers and it can kind yes. of... It can kind of mimic something, but it can't quite spin everything into something new. Like, if, if you'd given it my series, books one and two, and said, write the third one, I'm sure it would have come up with some kind of competent thing, but it wouldn't have come up with a lot of the things that I put in that there, was, there wasn't any information in books one and two, because I'm just sort of... Hmm. I'm adding things in which changes the context of previous stuff that, like, that just comes out of nowhere, right? That the things happen, that, that, you know... Because I was saving them elements of the world building and the magic. Because there was nothing to hint at that, it wouldn't know how it couldn't make that up. It wouldn't be able to just do this thing because it would just sort of carry on what's there, at least for now. And hmm. I'll eat my words, maybe one day I will do that. But as you say, what are you gonna do? Just roll over? You're just gonna yeah, keep exactly. going, right? You're gonna just keep going. Yeah. You, know? you cross you cross the bridge <laughs> when you come to it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's an interesting, I never really thought of it that way about how past events could, you know, the context of them change or things that you set up that only you knew about that you planned on doing later or that you decide to do later on a whim. That's, yeah, I never thought of it that way about kind of writing the next book in a series. 
because humans are random chaos monkeys and computers are too logical, right? It won't be able to just <laughs> think, oh, I'll just, I'll just do this now and I'll, I'll make it work, you know, because it won't think to do that. It can think to do that, right? Maybe I'm naive, but I don't think it can. Just completely invent a new thing and shove it in and be like, yeah, this was here the whole time, you know, stuff like that, yeah. Random chaos monkeys are like that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask a bit about the writing and drafting process for you, how that goes. Yeah. Uh, do you do a lot of revisions? Is it more you write sections until they are perfect? How is it for you? <clears throat> uh, I usually have a decent idea, like a decent kind of plan um, of the whole book. Um, more so now than I used to. I, I find that more planning now is very helpful for me. Um, I'll as I, I'll start, you know, the start of a book is usually quite straightforward. Then I'll get gunked down about once I have about 30% or so. And then at that point, I just try to take each chapter at a time, really plan it out to the nth degree. So, like, there's almost as, it's almost as long in note form as it would be as an actual chapter. But a lot of that is explaining the motivations to myself, stuff like this. So then when I come to write it, um, it's much, much easier and it comes out a lot cleaner. Um... But typically I find every 40 to 50,000 words, I kind of take a little step back and sometimes I know, okay, I need to make this adjustment for what will happen later. And I tend to just do that. I tend to just make those adjustments, those developmental revisions as I go. Um, sometimes I'll push on, but, if, but over a big book, you know, these books, the last book defined was 250,000 words published. It was 300,000 words and I cut it down to 250. So they're, they're very big books. If I if I kept just pushing forward, it would be carrying over too many errors, if that makes sense. And then you would eventually go back and forget, and forget to do the revision because, you you know, best will in the world, even though. So I, every 50,000 odd words, I kind of take stock of where I am and sometimes I'll make revisions then and then move on. So by the time I actually get to the absolute end point of like, when I have something that's roughly a first draft, most of that has gone through quite a few revisions already. So then the kind of final revision process is a much quicker, much quicker thing. How, how important are, or do you, what do you look for in, in beta readers or even in the editor? Do you look for certain things or certain work that they've done previously? Or is that, <clears throat> how does that process go for you? Um, so when it comes to like developmental edits, I just, I'm very lucky. One of my best friends is, uh, works as a developmental editor mm. um, at, the, at the publishing company we founded together and he's the best person I've ever met that, about this stuff you can just brainstorm with him and talk things through and what might take me days of agony can take us 15 minutes to knock through and we'll find the solution mm. pretty quick like he's very very he's very good at high level the, the story structure and, and mm. everything being paced right and just kind of can just give you good ideas that you can grab and then latch onto like yes that's my lifeline and now you figure out then so he's just which is he's just brilliant at brainstorming and going for that whole thing so if i get stuck i go to him i beg for some time and um <laughs> and, and we work it out uh <laughs> i buy him a lot of smoothies and a lot of burgers and stuff like that <laughs> uh uh copy editor that took a while i went through several copy editors over the years until i've landed with um someone that i really trust that I feel really works with my style that actually gets the stuff and likes the stuff and does good work because I have had some unfortunate experiences with copy editors it's not always smooth going um, sometimes they're good people that are highly recommended but maybe they rushed one job you know it's, it's something you just you don't know but um, with my current copy editor that's not the case the books usually come out pretty damn clean very happy with him and he's read all my stuff so he really he knows also the story but the style and how it should go and he's got his own little internal sort of wiki of how everything should be for you know what's capitalized and what's not capitalized and that sort of thing um which is very helpful so that took a little while to find um so if you were if you were thinking of self-publishing and you have a bad experience of a copy editor yeah sometimes that happens and it it sucks um just um, hopefully the next time won't be so bad and hopefully one day you land with someone that you really like and and, and can really trust. Hmm. Lots I of options. I wanted to ask... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Parma. I was just... It was nonsense. Go ahead. 
Um, I wanted to ask uh, similar so any long form work, especially in epic fantasy. For example, you mentioned you are a huge Tolkien fan. So Tolkien actually wrote all three parts more or less, and he was able to revise the previous parts. and yeah. before he went but nowadays that is not possible we have one volume it is published and then the next volume and hence forth is there a cascading effect and does that become restrictive or if one has an outline is it still relatively uh um i think if it, is, i mean is it not an issue well i mean token did that because he wrote this giant thing before any thought that someone was actually going to do it right i know it's i know he was asked to do a, a, a second hobbit but i don't think that's what his publisher expected so um every <laughs> they would have been that guy would you know um they would have been well from their rights to be like uh no we're not <laughs> um thankfully they did but he was kind of writing that more for his own pleasure in some ways and there wasn't that expectation so that was really great i mean if you have the clout and the and the resources now you can do it it's a question of time right so i think joe Abercrombie's I think Joel for both of his series had all the books written before they were published um hmm. I know definitely for the latest trilogy I'm not sure about the very first trilogy but I know like, at least for the his latest one all of them were finished before he released them which means he could go back and he could layer you know he could edit things and and, and work them through but that's Joel Abercrombie so he can take that time it will be published you know thumbs up all good um doesn't need to worry about xyz um so if you get to that position i think that that could work really well um you know but with this series that i'm writing right now is it will be five books it be tough to write all five books first and then start releasing them um because as i was writing the first book in this series i was already full time uh, writing i was already i don't they made that transition but you you kind of have to you can't sit around for 5 years without releasing something um so there's a bit there's a bit of that at play it's just the nature of like people i think everyone would love to do that complete it make it a masterpiece and then put that out but there is a reality that people need to traditional authors need to hit deadlines to get advance money so they can eat and pay mortgages and self publishers also need to release something every now and again so that the algorithms don't forget about us and throw us out and every so often there'll be someone that you know puts out that one book and it's a giga hit but that's very very rare you 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 do typically have to release um regularly to the standard of your genre so an epic fantasy releasing a book a year is great in fact that can be considered quick for some people if you were in like rpg you've got to release much faster typically depending on how big it is you know romance offers they're putting out sometimes a book they're short books but a book a month some people some of them because they're just blazing through stuff and that's expected because the the mark the, the readers have a certain they just you know every readers of all these genres have different expectations you've got to sort of meet that unless you're in a real exception of which very few people are the exception you you've got to sort of meet halfway there so is it limiting to write one at a time sometimes i mean there are things that i discover along the way and it would have been great to have known all of that as i was writing book one it would have been it would have probably made it better but um I, that's okay that i mean it, it, that's that's fine by me i've each book is outlined quite well as i go as before i start each one i do have a rough idea of what might be coming um but i allow that freedom of letting myself also think of new things as i go to like it's not too restrictive um could i mean I, as i said i'd love to do it um i think the reality is that i think at best for even for a future series i might be able to finish like one like maybe two books ahead of time um but you you don't want to sit on things for for too long um especially self pubbing you do want to try and hit a relatively you want to try and hit stuff relatively frequently just so those those algorithms don't forget about you and listen until you're a Joe Abercrombie or Will White you your audience isn't that big that they that they can't forget about you you know you you have to keep reminding them that you're out there and keep giving them keep giving them good stories um i don't think it's i but I, i for me i don't think it's a problem um i think i think i can still write great books and come up with cool things and uh, i'm happy with that thank you you uh, mentioned the algorithm 
and algorithms, yeah. I should say. Um, how much? How much does that does that come into play with how you uh, your approach to marketing or getting the word out about uh, your uh, upcoming projects or existing projects? Well, having just said the algorithm is really important, I didn't release a book in twenty twenty two, so I completely um, <laughs> didn't take my own advice. But it was still a good year because uh, you're an epic. You can take a little bit longer, mm. um, and things are set up in my end that. Um, I don't rely so much on it being super, super frequent. But um, because I don't really super frequently, I actually do need to work a bit harder. I, I'm not just tickling the algorithm constantly by releasing stuff. Um, mm-hmm. to, if you release something and it's mildly successful, you'll get like a kind of 90-day boost mm-hmm. on these systems. So if you're someone that can release every, every 90 days, some people can, um, you'll keep spinning that around. Um, even if you release every six months, you'll, you'll get more of a spin for it. If you're doing a book a year like I am, <clears throat> you've not so much, you have to, you'll still get a launch boost, but you, you have to work a bit harder to get the word out, like you say. So yeah, ev- everything, man. So like building up social channels, mailing lists, Discord, you know, trying to reach out and work with um, booktubers, reviewers, and just mm-hmm. making sure that they know a book is coming and make sure they have a copy and hopefully they'll get to it one day. They're super busy. Yeah. Um, yeah. offering myself offering up to do interviews as much as possible and you run some Amazon ads and um, I, I have a I'm fortunate enough to sell well on audio that I have a rep with Audible that helps me get promotions and other opportunities hmm. um, so you know planning that and making sure everything's you know square in there um, doing work with Broken Binding um, with um, signed editions and things like this so you get you know slightly different audience there yeah just constantly trying to do activity mostly around the launch time leading up to a launch or just after launch in the downtime between really cranking into a draft just throwing everything I've got at it to hopefully 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 be heard a little bit above the noise and then and then back to writing hmm. and you know, after a certain point at least for me I have, because I only put out one book a year I try to make sure that book is as good as I can possibly get it and then you know, because I, I don't want to just play the algorithm game. I, I hope that the books are good enough that, you know, 40 years from now, people might still find them and, and buy them. You know, but hopefully they can sell for my entire life. And that's much more valuable than trying to just churn the algorithm, you know, in the short term. Mm-hmm. That's my that's my philosophy. Um, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just lucky, but it seems to be going okay. Yeah. I was going to ask, actually, do you find that the whole self-promotion aspect of self-publishing, does it sometimes impact your creativity negatively, if only because of the fatigue or the cognitive load and that it, it impinges on your, when you actually get back fully to writing, does that stuff kind of stick around a bit too long in your, in your mind and affects your... Um. Your routine? Think, um, <clears throat> things like this, like chatting to you guys, chatting, like doing interviews or chatting doesn't at all. I love talking yeah. shop. That's great. That yeah. doesn't affect me at all. Um, but I guess like more, more grindy admin related to that can, like setting up, um, setting up discounts and getting the promo sites to, and going through all the admin can take a while. And even if it only takes an hour and a half in total to set up one, somehow that does like just fatigue a little bit you just feel like oh I've looked at a lot of boxes and you know um, so yeah that can do it a little bit um, but that's that's not that doesn't happen too often so okay. anything that's interacting with readers and reviewers and other people in any capacity is is fine that doesn't really that doesn't really hinder it at all um, and there is there is some of the other stuff but it's not you know it's maybe it's a little bit it, it, it feels more than it is I think hmm. So you think you, there's a good balance between between the two that works for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, again, everyone's different. For me, as I say, like on the lead up to a launch, around the launch, just after a launch, I'm mostly just business stuff, marketing stuff, advertising stuff. Like I'm not really writing much um, yeah. at all. Um, in between these books, so like, I mean, I finished, Defiant was completely finished end of March. It went to the narrator like the last day of March. And I didn't really write anything until August when I started working on two novellas, which I've, I've now finished. But there was just months there where like I was 
taking a break. I had lots of weddings to go to, but it was visiting the studio where they do recording. So I was going there to like meet Peter, the narrator, and the team and record a little bit myself and do stuff like that. And then making sure everything with Audible was ready, making sure every reviewer that I could contact had knew about it and had copies and things like that. And it's surprising. I, you sometimes think, how is, the, how is that passing the time? The time really gets filled up with a lot of that. But I was also planning the next book. So yeah. even so I was planning the next book, launched the next launched that book in July, um, did 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 those novellas in August and September, and now I'm back to the, the next book, but I already have a plan in place so I can hit the ground running. So um, even if I'm not writing it's I'm planning or doing something related to it. It's never I'm rarely just completely away from and the one thing with the psychology that I struggle with still is like planning is still writing it just because yeah. you're not putting down a thousand mm-hmm. words of prose it's obviously good work but psychologically we as writers often get really worked up with our word count per day um has its utility but you know if, if you've done a good stint of planning and you've made some breakthroughs the probably the, the creative energy you needed to figure out something to do with the plot the story character arc motivations or world building is much more to sort of even just to get like one really good idea that you can then knock down really fast it takes a lot more energy than just writing you know some prose for the story because you're really having to think in a major way you're not you know when you just get into the flow in the zone like a, a good dialogue scene can come out a lot easier once you kind of once you already have all that in place and so um but we think oh i didn't manage to do much today i only got like one thing figured out but no, that's a really important thing so <laughs> it's just trying to let yourself be okay with the idea that you did do lots of work it just wasn't actually putting words down but it still counts hmm. yeah now that's a really good point because i i've done a little bit of writing but it's it's not fiction and uh i had an ex-partner who was also trying to be a fic- he was trying to be a fiction writer fancy and and I, I, I relate and relate by proxy to, to a lot of that. that. We have a certain idea of what productivity and creativity yeah. actually looks like, but there, there are lots of different facets to it and in other <coughs> creative mediums as well. It's like if you're actually planning or figuring out like a, yeah, something in the plot, character interaction, yeah. you're actually, you're, you're creating something. It's part of yeah. the process. I, I, it's really hard. I mean, I, even even though I'm seven books down, they're big books. It's my full job. I sell lots of copies. You'd think I'd be used to this. No, every time it's I feel the same way. But a, a good a good thing to remember is um, like have you ever have you guys watched all the behind the scenes of Lord of the Rings on the on the films like the making of a stuff? lot of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, like if you if you've got access to them, some of them are on YouTube. But like, look at the stuff they did pre production. They took you. It was. This is why it turned out so well. Right? They had years yeah. and years. They were storyboarding the hell out of that thing. They nice. made a lot of the costumes before they even rolled the camera. They made miniatures of a lot of the sets, and they had like the lipstick camera shots of figurines, and a lot of the shots from the the pre production stuff is the exact shot from the film. So he, you know, they could plan how they'll angle the shots first. You know, everything. A lot was planned out. That's not rolling yeah. the camera with actors. That's a lot of time that was spent not shooting a movie in quotes, but all of that was really, really vital because they turned yeah. out so well because they had all that stuff there to back them up and they weren't just winging it. Um, and so you can think if you're if you're someone that does like to plan an outline, uh, that is what that is. That is all that good work is really, really vital. It will help you even if in the moment you feel like it's not productive. It's super productive. But yet yeah, I know it's a struggle. <laughs> so it's, it's OK if you feel bad about it. But try not to. <laughs> no, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just the the marketing aspect sounds exhausting, especially with all these other social media platforms. Do you have a certain mm. platform or platforms that you focus on? Because it can take, it can really take your whole day away if you had to visit all sure. of them. Sure. Yeah. If you sit in them, I mean, for a lot, for a while, I essentially ignored a lot of it. Um, because it, it didn't really seem to impact me at all. Um, I wasn't that kind of person, so I just sort of ignored them. And I managed to get away with, with that for a long time. I've only started to engage more in the last year just because I've, I've pulled back direct advertising spend. So for a while, I, I was spending quite heavily on Facebook and things like this. And as all of that started to collapse and be useless, it was like, okay, great. I mean, I'm saving... And, and, and luckily, 
I'd kind of push the boulder up the hill enough that, I, you know, word of mouth, I'm now selling. I don't necessarily need to just bang out lots of ads in that sense. If they ever worked, it's always questionable whether they ever worked. Um, so that's great, saving some money. But if I don't do anything, I will, I will feel like that's dodgy. You want to be doing something. So I've, I've tried to engage more recently. Um, I, I, I would say to people, unless they really love doing it, just find one platform that they all that they quite like and just focus on that one platform don't try to do them all and just because someone says do tiktok you don't have to do tiktok you can, you can <laughs> sod off with that if you really if you don't care if you're cranky like me and you're like i don't know how this works like i load it up and literally it just bombards me with nonsense and i don't and that close it down okay i'm like what is this crap so I ignore TikTok, that's fine. Maybe that's to my detriment, I don't care. It would not be worth it mentally to try and get on top of that. I don't walk around in life with a camera. You know, I don't know how to make the little clips. I don't do that. I write big books and that's what I do, okay? So you can just find, if you if you must, find, pick one, pick one poison and drink that slowly. Don't worry about trying to guzzle all of the poisons. Um, um, so I... I I typically use X, if it's called that, it's called X now, isn't it? I will use X to post sometimes and then get, I, I use that more as like, almost like a direct, it's like a kind of LinkedIn for writers and people, like people use that as a way to do like kind of, kind of soft networking. It's not, you know, kind of, can, that's how people kind of connect without giving each other their phone numbers, you know, in a kind of collegiate sort of way. That seems to be where that's, that functions best and that's really great. Um, but I, my personal love, I love Discord. Um, I have a Discord server. We've got eleven hundred people in there. Um, it's really great. People play Dungeons and Dragons with each other in there. Mm. Share fan art, all sorts of stuff. Um, share theories about the books and and all sorts of stuff. And um, I wish I had started that sooner. That's the one that I really wish I had started sooner because it's really it's a really nice organic way just for people to chat, not just to me but to each other. Yeah. Um, it's free, which is good. If you tag people in there, they will get the alert. There's not like that kind of algorithmic blockage like mm -hmm. system. Um, if people mute the server, that's obviously sort of shuts it down, but that's if they choose to. And it seems that most people are cool to kind of keep it open as long as you don't spam them. Um, so I, I really like Discord for that. I think it's really natural. And I, I feel the most natural on there as well. Um, whereas some of the other times I feel like, okay, I'm posting here because they kind of have to post here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, now I'm fortunate enough to have a, a PA who is starting to post on a lot of other things on my behalf and she's trying to manage that and so I don't have to do it and she can work the hashtags and do all that and that's that's one way you can do it. You can get someone to help you. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but, yeah, don't, don't go, don't worry. You know, um, I've, I've sold a lot of books and my Twitter following is like 1,500 people. Hmm. It was lower a year ago. Like a lot of it, and, and a lot of people think that you need a big social media following to sell books. You you don't. Okay, you can you can really sell a book. You don't need to have this huge presence. It works for some people, but it's not some magic bullet. If you look at any offers that typically have a big following, they have a big following because they're big offers. It's a chicken right, yeah. and egg. They didn't. Yeah, yeah. They didn't magically have millions of followers and then became a massive name in epic fantasy. They have lots of followers because they're a big name. Uh, full stop. Right. It, it, how books sell is this mystical art. It's not necessarily down to, 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 to Twitter. Can be sometimes, but I, I would sort of be shocked if I've sold many books via that, you know. Um, yeah. I think there's other things you can do. Yeah, that's one thing I've talked to other authors about is, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people are just getting started and they, and they worry about their following <coughs> it, but it, just yeah. because you have 5,000 followers doesn't mean that that's 5,000 people who are going to buy your book. I mean, no. that's not yeah. no, that's no. not necessarily I mean, you can even I mean, you can look at like, like some of some of the YouTubers that have released books, um, and they sometimes give you numbers. Um, I think you know Daniel Green might be a good example. He did a video where he showed how many copies of his novellas and stuff that he sold um, off the bat, and and so he's got like four hundred odd thousand subs, maybe more, or something like that. Yeah, that's about right. Mm -hmm. If you break down the number of sales on a single title, it's maybe five percent. Of that, of that number, and probably a bunch of people that bought it aren't subscribed to them, they're just yeah. other people that came. So, like, it's going to be a really small number that might come through. So, mm -hmm. it's not like, you know, it's it's helpful, 
but it's kind of scary that someone could have half a million subscribers and it might sell 10,000 books yeah. for it or something, you know, just, just on its own. And that, that could be, that could be the, the kick. It might even be less than that, but that could be the kick that launches it into the systems and gets it really visible. And then, and then it starts to kind of snowball and take effect. I mean, that can certainly be what happens. Um, but yeah, you don't worry about making the book as good as you can. Worry about knowing what kind of reader is going to like the book. Worry about getting an amazing cover, a good title, because title is really important too. Don't have some really odd esoteric title. Um, have a really great burp, very great cover. Know if you're writing in a certain kind of space, so I know I'm writing a drag, Dragon Rider epic. You kind of know who you can talk to, you can know your comparisons. All of that is way more important than how many followers you've got on Instagram. Like, 100%. 100%. So we're not going to see you dancing with your book on TikTok? <laughs> well, never say never. <laughs> I, I don't get it either. I, do, I, don't I, get it. I just won't that's, be, that's I, a I thing. Just, I just won't be set. I just won't be filming it. But if someone wants to film that for me, then maybe. <laughs> if someone yeah. is willing to film that and give me the footage, I'll upload it. But I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Know TikTok, I TikTok is the is the thing where I went. I'm too old for this. <laughs> yeah, me too. I just at the, can't at, with at the age of when TikTok came out, I think I was 29. And I was like, I'm already too old for this. I'm hard pass. <laughs> yeah. I don't get it either, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's rough. Plus now YouTube is kind of like doing shorts to try yeah, and yeah. <laughs> get bits of that market back. So it's like, okay, whatever. I prefer <laughs> medium to long form content generally in any case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cling on to that attention span for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, and that attention span, I think, is like when people have thousands of followers on X or YouTube or wherever it is, you know, a book is an investment. It's a time investment. It's not yeah. just, it's a, it's a, an, an, you engage with it and you have to, um, you know, spend time with it. It's, so it's, I think it's, it's important to remember too, like, just because you have so many followers or whatever, doesn't mean you're, you're going to get that investment or they're, they're going to get that return from subscribers or followers. So, yeah, no, always. I mean, don't. Pick one, have a go at it. Um, but I would sort of use it, <clears throat> I would use it more to try and engage with other writers in your space, um, some of the reviewers, and just try to be kind of getting to be part of that community and just kind of try to make um, colleague, you know, colleagues and friends and peers. You Think of it using it that way rather than worrying about who's following you mm -hmm. and, 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 and start from there and then, and then go from there and people people will come and join you. If you write, if you, if you've, you know, put the links on your website and then your books, you know, to the one that matters to you. And if people are buying your book and enjoying it, a certain percentage of them will come and follow you or join your mailing list or whatever it is. Yeah. And over time that will build up. But, you know, I, I like to use them more as a way to kind of keep in touch with friends and peers that, you know, other writers and, 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 and people that have met at cons or, or whatever else, or just getting a sense of what's going on in the, in the space. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yeah, if you worry about your follow account, that's weird because you, you should really be obsessing about how many books you're selling, not, not how many followers you've got, right? That's yeah. the one to really worry about. Refreshing the dashboard constantly, that's the, that's the tech yeah. you've got, to, tech. You've got yeah. to be careful of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, it's always one of those hot button issues, but how do you handle reviews or reviews for your work and do you ever... <clears throat> interact with the reviewers uh, after they leave a re whether it's a positive or negative review what are kind of the guidelines that you you uh, follow for that? if it's a generic review on like Amazon you can't respond or, or mm -hmm. you can but it's just you, you can but uh, I never do uh, on Goodreads yeah I, I just tend to just I just read them I tend not to respond because if sounds very bad if you responded to even all the good ones you'd be there at a certain point, you'd be there all day just saying, oh, thanks, for, thank you. You know, it can be, it would take a lot of time to go through every review mm -hmm. and respond at all. So it's kind of easier just to not respond to any of them. Um, e even if it's very negative. If something's weird, like a negative one, you're going to get negative ones. If something's really funny, weird, like really bizarre, weird, like crazy, like I, I sometimes will screen grab them and just sort of post about them in a funny way. You're obviously taking people's names out. Um, and that can be that can be amusing because it's just people are just 
I say though, you're like, have you, re- have you read, is this the right book or whatever it may be? Um, you know, people that tell you you've written about dragons wrong or, um, I, I, I accidentally offended all vegans by having the dragons eat meat. That was a big, <laughs> big no, no, uh, <laughs> stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, I like to, um, post about that cause it's kind of funny, but you know, if I, if I, um, if a reviewer that I've been in touch with and sent a book, uh, reviews and enjoys it, I tend to say, thanks very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. That sort of thing. Would you like this? Would you like the next one? And you know, that sort of thing. Um, if they don't like it, I'll, I'll sometimes say, well, sorry, that didn't work out. Thanks for trying it. If they're nasty, I just tend to ignore it because what, yeah. what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, it's unpleasant, but what are you going to do? Yeah, definitely. The, uh, the the time always flies, but I have uh, wanted to, I'd like, I try to ask all of our guests uh, one last question. That is, uh, what was your first job and what did you learn from that experience? <laughs> So, am I? First real job. See, I see. I came out of. I worked. I worked some interning stuff through summers at uni, and then after uni, I came to London to do that law course that I talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I finished that, put the book out. So, what was my first real job? I mean, I guess the first job that I did that wasn't like an interning thing. Uh, though some of those were paid I, I, yeah I did I did the classic thing in some ways like after, once I had the first book out and dived out of law I picked up a retail job for like six months and uh, I'm not sure that taught me an awful lot other than <laughs> if, I, if I'm left to my own thoughts I can come up with <laughs> I'm, not, I'm okay being with my own thoughts because sometimes it's really quiet especially on a Sunday in some of these stores and you're just sort of sitting there like twiddling your thumbs a bit and thinking in your own head um yeah, I'm not sure that taught me too much. But the next job I had after that was at Bloomsbury Publishing for a while um, in London. Um, that was that was interesting in a number of, uh, a number of ways. I was doing some data some data management stuff there and cleaning Excel spreadsheets and doing stuff like that. So that gave me some efficiencies in how to use Excel, I suppose. But I think about one key lesson, like. I've just always been very competitive and very self-driven, like always competing against myself. So I was always going to, whatever I ended up doing would be trying to outdo myself all the time. And that's what I tried to do for each book, just constantly trying to outdo myself. Hmm. So I went from uni to retail, to publishing, to just me, just, just being a writer. So quite quick. Nice. You're doing something right um, on your website. You have a on all the list. You're um, on the Amazon hundred, the top one hundred best selling titles. You were number one in epic fantasy, number one in dragons and mythical creatures, number one in sword and sorcery, and number one in YA epic fantasy. So you're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 far so good. Touch wood. Touch wood. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Hopefully it keeps going. Thank you. That's tough. So uh, for anyone looking to connect with you, Michael, where's the best place to find you? Uh, probably the best place just to go to my website, which is uh, michaelrmiller.co.uk and links to everything there, links to all the books, all my socials, including that cool Discord server, all of it on there. Probably the best hub to come find me. Awesome. And Muriel, where's the best place to find you? YouTube. Uh, my, my YouTube channel, uh, The Purple Bookworm with a Y. And I I'm also <laughs> review books on Goodreads. <laughs> Awesome. And Paramita? Uh, I can be found on the page chewing forum. I'm there almost uh, every day. Yeah, I can. that's the best place to find me too. And our little community there. And if anyone ever wants to join us for one of these Fridays, uh, join our forums and check them out. We've got a lot of really great people there. We have great conversations and um, yeah, just a friendly community. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, thanks again, Michael. Really appreciate your time. And Muriel and Paramita, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been yeah. great fun. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk very soon. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank bye you. bye, everyone.